Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Personal Responsibility Lawyer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Lovins of the law firm Lovins Trosclair, where we are a personal injury law firm and we help people deal with all kinds of tragedies that mostly involve some sort of severe or catastrophic injury and sometimes even death. But today we're going to deal with some things that are a little uh, less traumatic than that. My guest today is Professor Brian Fitzpatrick from the Vanderbilt Law School, where he teaches law, um, focusing on class action litigation, federal courts, judicial selection, and constitutional law. Now, prior to teaching law, he didn't really do much. Um, he got a some sort of a degree from some school in Indiana, <laughs> Notre Dame or something like that. We we will overlook um, that stain on his resume. But he did some other redeeming things after that. He uh, finished number one in his law school, his class at Harvard Law School, went on to clerk on the Ninth Circuit, and then also for a guy at the Supreme Court named Antonin Scalia, who is quite the legal and cultural icon. Um, and we may hear a little bit more about that uh, coming up in a, in the the podcast. After that, he worked for, he was a special counsel to John Cornyn, the U.S. Senator from my state of Texas, um, special counsel for Supreme Court nominations. He spent some time working at a big law firm called Sidley Austin. Uh, he did a little teaching at the New York University School of Law, and then he has been at Vanderbilt since 2007, where he's received uh, some uh, awards for his professorship and his ability to teach, which there are distinct uh, skills in being a professor, uh, writing and researching, and then also teaching. And um, so with that brief background, uh, Professor Fitzpatrick, welcome to the Personal Responsibility Lawyer. Well, thank you so much, Michael. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here. And, you know, as you went through some of the highlights of my CV, it does remind me I have some connections to Texas uh, with my work with John Cornyn. And so it's, uh, you know, doubly um, special to be on the podcast today. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thanks for being here. So you have a book coming out on, I believe it's October 23rd of 2019, called The Conservative Case for Class Actions. And I, I think with any good discussion of something public policy related, we got to start with a few definitions. So let's jump into the first one and or the fo the most difficult one, I think. When you use the word conservative, what do you mean? Well, that's actually a very good question. <laughs> and it's, uh, <laughs> and what I mean basically is people who associate themselves with the right in American politics. And I'm, I'm really trying to capture, um, Republican leaning conservatives and libertarians. Those are the people I'm, I'm speaking about and really to whom I am speaking in the book. Um, and I, and I kind of, um, rely upon people like Milton Friedman. Um, you know, I consider him to be kind of the father of the, non-libertarian conservative school of economics. And then I rely upon some libertarians as well, like Friedrich Hayek and, and folks like that. And so I, I'm trying to capture both what I would call the more utilitarian conservatives like Milton Friedman and the more um, libertarian conservatives like, like Friedrich Hayek. But it's basically people who traditionally have been identified with the right in American politics. And then the other thing to define, and I think this is probably a lot easier to define, but what do you mean say class action? Well, I mean a lawsuit that is certified under Rule 23 or the state equivalent, where a representative plaintiff will be able to bind uh, absent persons that are included within the class definition when the case is certified. So the traditional class action lawsuit that we see in federal court or the equivalent in our, in our state courts. And can you give a couple of quick examples of things? 
real or hypothetical class actions, something that someone would bring as a class action, as opposed to just bringing a lawsuit on their own behalf and only on their own behalf? Sure. So, you know, most of the time people decide to bring class actions when it is not worthwhile to sue just on their own because the amount of money at stake is not big enough to interest a lawyer to take the case on contingency. And so you need to multiply everyone's injuries by the size of the class in order to make the case financially viable for a contingency lawyer. And so, you know, there are some very big examples um, in recent years that I think your your listeners would be quite familiar with. Um, one of the most prominent has been the litigation against Volkswagen for its uh, diesel engine scandal. That was a class action that was filed. Well, really, there were class actions filed all over the country. and They were consolidated and transferred over to the Northern District of California. And after, you know, a couple of years of, of litigation, there was a big settlement there um, for, you know, roughly $10 billion, where Volkswagen basically had to buy everyone's car back from them at a very generous uh, price. Another example that's maybe closer geographically to your listeners is uh, the British Petroleum BP oil spill. Um, you know, when uh, the Deepwater Horizon exploded, it caused a, a lot of uh, turmoil in the Gulf, uh, shut down tourism, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, there was a class action that was filed for lost business profits, um, as well as medical harms. And, um, that was settled as well. I, I think BP is now, um, spent over, over $10 billion, uh, to pay claims from, from those settlements. Uh, so those are some examples. You know, there may be some people that had big enough losses in the oil spill to sue on their own. Um, but the vast majority of people didn't. Mm -hmm. And in the Volkswagen case, you know, um, it's not clear how many people would have sued on their own there either because, you know, the value of a car may not be big enough to interest a, a lawyer to take on Volkswagen. Well, especially in – you talk at, at a little bit of length about what Volkswagen actually did. It's not the sort of thing that you can just walk into court – and have the owner of the car testify. Um, the expenses, if I understand that case right, you had to pay some experts, and I say you, whoever the plaintiff's class counsel was, had to pay some experts, probably a lot of money, to come in ex and explain to the court, or at least be prepared to explain to the court and to a jury, what Volkswagen had done. And if you had to do that on each one of those car claims, that the expenses dwarf the recovery, if I understand that right. I think that's true. You know, it, it's an interesting question, actually, and, and you, being closer to the ground, may have a better answer to this than than I do. It's kind of an interesting question of, like, what is the smallest um, value of a case that you can really interest a 33% contingency lawyer to take? Um, but, you know, if, if you're looking at maybe $10,000, in potential damages from the Volkswagen, um, from a Volkswagen lawsuit, you know, that you're looking at maybe only $3,000 for the lawyer. I'm just not sure how many lawyers will take that case, even if all you have to do is, is bring the plaintiff in to testify. But you're right. The big issue in, in Volkswagen was less about liability. Volkswagen had basically admitted that they had done all this cheating, but there was a lot of questions about what the proper measure of damages uh, is sure. for the fraud. And, you know, that required a lot of legal research, a lot of legal argument. And then it did require some expert testimony to capture the most generous measure of damages. And, um, I think you're right that no lawyer would have taken a case like that on an individual basis or very few. One point I want to clarify uh, another definitional issue. You've used the term injury. And I think you're using that in a different way than in a legal sense and not in a, uh, a non-legal sense where, um, an injury, when I'm not practicing law, 
an, an injury is I hurt myself. You know, I, I broke my arm. I got a, uh, some sort of a physical injury that I, in, in most class action cases, almost all of them, I think that's not really what you're talking about. Can you explain to, to someone who doesn't use the term injury in the legal sense, what you mean? You're exactly right, Michael. Uh, what I mean generally is economic injury or economic harms. So you paid more for a product than you would have paid had you known what was really in the product or you would not have bought the product at all. So you lost money. We're talking about you've lost money. You have not lost a limb. You have not, you have not incurred some kind of phys- suffered some kind of physical injury. It is very rare and very difficult to get a class action certified for physical injuries. There was a, a piece of the class action in the BP case that was for medical um, monitoring, and I, I think some people could get compensation for some of their physical injuries there. Um, the NFL concussion litigation ended up being resolved as a class action. That, of course, is a physical injury case. But those are two exceptions that prove the rule. Ever since this Supreme Court case in the 1990s called Amkim, which involved asbestos personal injury claims, the Supreme Court said it's, you shouldn't be using the class action mm-hmm. for personal injuries because there are too many individual issues. And ever since then, it's been very hard to certify a physical injury case. And so generally what we're talking about we talk talking about class actions are economic harms, not physical harms. Now, your book is titled The Conservative Case for Class Actions. Um, putting the, the word conservative in there as opposed to just the case for class actions implies that there's, uh, there's something unique about the conservative case or the need to make that case. So why do you need to make the conservative case for class actions as opposed to just the case for class actions? Well, the reason I... I think we need to make the conservative case is because conservatives have been spending a great deal of effort over the last couple of decades to get rid of the class action. And I think um, that those efforts have been wrong. And I think they're the ones that need to be persuaded that the class action is worth keeping around. Liberals already like the class action. There are some dissenters on the left, but for the most part, it's very popular on the left. It's very unpopular on the right. And I, I think we've, we on the right have been a, been a bit misled into opposing the class action. And, and therefore, that's where I think the opportunity and the need to change minds lies. And so that's why I've, I've uh, devoted the book to be about and to speak to conservatives. And, you know, I'm one of those conservatives as you you know you recounted my my cv at the at the beginning but you know when i first got into this business of being a lawyer and even a law professor i think i shared the general conservative view that that class actions were an abu- usually an abuse of our system and that we needed to crack down on them but the more that i've studied them and the more that i've thought about them, i've really decided that I was my initial inclinations were wrong and that the class action is really the most conservative way to enforce the law and and I and I hope I can persuade some of my fellow conservatives and libertarians that I'm right about that one of the things you discuss in the book is what you call the ironic history of class actions explain what you mean by that well, yes. Uh, one of the things that is ironic is conservatives have ended up in this place where they are largely today against class actions in a very funny way. It, it has not been a straight line from the from the invention of the class action to where we are today. So, for most of um, the twentieth century. The Republican, the right, the conservative view was if we're going to create causes of action, then we should enforce them 
through private lawsuits brought by private citizens with private lawyers, private enforcement of the law. It was the left, the liberals, the Democrats, that instead wanted to enforce new rights, new causes of action with the government. And so uh, during the New Deal, Franklin Delano Roosevelt vetoed the first l labor laws hmm. uh, because he didn't want them to be privately enforced. He said, where's, where's the federal agency? <laughs> we need a federal agency to do this. We don't want to trust the bar to do this. And during the 60s and 70s, when, you know, we were creating new federal causes of action for employment discrimination and what have you, a lot of, there was a lot of Republican opposition to these statutes. And the way that they ended up getting enacted was the left said, okay, we'll abandon government agencies, government bureaucrats, enforcement of the law and let the law be enforced by the private bar instead. And the Republicans said, we'll go along with it then. And even, even as late as 1978, there was a proposal to abolish consumer class actions and replace it with the government enforcing the fraud laws and what have you. Abolish consumer class actions. It was, it was a, a proposal made in the United States Senate and it was made by Ted Kennedy and it was endorsed by the Carter administration. And so the and Republicans again opposed it. And it's just throughout most of the 20th century, Republicans thought we needed private enforcement and the Democrats thought we needed government enforcement. And then it's totally turned around today. Today, you will see the United States Chamber of Commerce saying, shut down class actions. The government can regulate us. The government can enforce the law. There was a a very famous Supreme Court case I talk about in the book, AT&T v. Concepcion, where the U.S. Supreme Court, my old boss, Justice Scalia, upholds class action waivers in arbitration agreements. He said companies can insulate themselves from class actions so long as they do it in an arbitration agreement. And there was an amicus brief that was written by some very prominent conservative academics. And they said, uh, the court should uphold these class action waivers. And they said, yes, we understand that that means for these small harm cases, no one's going to sue because it's not going to be worth anyone to sue or even to go to arbitration for 50 bucks. We understand there'll be no lawsuits if you say no class actions, but that's okay because the government, federal agencies can regulate the companies instead. So here we have the conservatives saying, government, please regulate us. Don't use private enforcement. And it's a complete reversal of how we've been thinking about things for most of the 20th so when the, century. And I'm going to use the Chamber of Commerce as my uh, sort of avatar for the anti-class action boogeyman. Obviously, the, the Chamber of Commerce is more than that, but I don't think it's false. To It, it doesn't mischaracterize who they are to say that they are a, a leading, if not the leading, uh, an enemy of the class action. What's their best argument for, I agree. Um, for why the government should be regulating them as opposed to having uh, the possibility of a class action being filed against them for some wrong that they commit? Well, I think there are basically two sets of arguments. One set of argument, uh, set of arguments is what I would call legitimate, but incorrect. The other set of arguments are arguments that they don't voice explicitly, but I think probably explain why they want the government instead of private enforcement. So let's just start with the latter for the moment. I, I, I think the number one real reason why businesses, uh, think Big businesses, like those in the U.S. Chamber, think that they have a better chance with the government than they do with the private bar is because, let's be honest, 
they have a lot of power over the government. We've all been hearing on the right about crony capitalism, sweetheart deals between the federal government and big companies. They have lobbyists. A lot of their personnel go work in the government for a few years and then come back out to private industry. In, in academia, we call it agency capture. And so there's this, this notion of crony capitalism that big businesses have a lot of power over the government and therefore they're not afraid of the government because they have a lot of influence over the government. You compare that to the private bar, especially, I mean, if you're in, in federal court where you have life tenured independent federal judges, you know, you don't have that kind of influence if you're, if you're a litigant. You're at the whim of a private lawyer and a life tenured judge in federal court and you, you can't uh, bend those institutions to your will as readily. So I think a lot of people think big businesses like the government now because they have a lot of sway over the government. So I, I think that is one potential explanation for why the chamber would prefer government to the bar. Um, I think another set of explanations is that they think the class actions are so abusive so misguided that they'd rather take their chances with the government, which is not as abusive and not as misguided. And so I think these are very legitimate concerns. You know, the crony capitalism is not a legitimate reason to do anything, but fear about misguided abusive lawsuits, I think that is a legitimate reason to be concerned about class actions. I say these arguments are incorrect because if you look at the data, I don't think they're very well supported. So, you know, one of the biggest arguments against class actions, and I devote an entire chapter in the book to this, is that they are overwhelmingly meritless lawsuits. And we all know the examples. And I think my, my favorite example from recent years is the subway footlong <laughs> class action. You know, someone filed, I think, one or maybe even two class actions. Yeah claiming that the Subway sandwiches, some of them were not actually 12 inches long, that some were only 11 inches <laughs> long. And uh, it, it, it's comical, and, and it is frivolous, because Subway uses the same bread in every sandwich. It's just sometimes the bread bakes a little differently. <laughs> so the whole thing is... Your ridiculous. chemical engineering should be and able so to figure know... out why that is and fix it. You're a chemical engineer, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, exactly, that's exactly right. But um, so we've all heard examples like this, and we can shake our heads along with the U.S. Chamber and say, yeah, you're right, that's, that's frivolous. But the question is, how often are there lawsuits like that compared to lawsuits like Volkswagen or BP? And, you know, one of the things I try to examine in this chapter in the book is what does the data say about meritless class action cases? And there's... There's a few ways you can get at it. Uh, so one way I get at it is how often are class action cases dismissed on a motion to dismiss? And this is what I would say is a, is a ceiling on the number of meritless cases because sometimes you'll dismiss a case on a motion to dismiss and it's not meritless. You know, sometimes it's, it's plausible on the facts, but there's a, a, a good faith disagreement about what the law says and the, and the court interprets the law at the motion to dismiss stage and, and rules against you. And, but it's, so the number of meritless class actions is going to be can smaller. I, can I pause you just for a second? Yeah. So on motion to sure. dismiss, um, it's been, I don't do, most of my work is state court, but this is a rule 12 B six. And if I remember my federal courts correctly, what a defendant says in a motion to dismiss is even if the plaintiff proves all of the facts that they have alleged, they still lose. Do I, is that basically, do I have that right? Yes, you do with one modification. Um, that's what I would call the, the legal motion to dismiss. So, this, so you think that the law doesn't allow the plaintiff to recover for whatever the plaintiff has alleged. Since these two Supreme Court cases called 
Twombly and Iqbal from about 10 to 15 years ago. Um, the now this, the, the courts are allowed to look at your factual allegations. And if they're not plausible, the court can dismiss the case on that ground as well. So they, so one motion to dismiss says, even if everything you say is true, the law is not with you, so you lose. The other motion to dismiss says, we're not going to assume everything is true. We're going to look to see if what you say is plausible. And if what you say is not plausible, we can dismiss on that ground too. So you can really go after the factual allegations and the legal theory on the motion to dismiss now. So it's, 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 it's a higher standard in federal mm -hmm. court than it is in many state courts. They, they changed that, that doctrine again about 10 or 15 years ago. And so it's a very potent opportunity for defendants to take a crack at, at, at cases. Mm -hmm. And w what we find is that only about 20% of class action cases are dismissed on a motion to dismiss, and, and, and I think that means the number of meritless cases is, is much smaller than that. And um, you can look at it other ways too, you know, uh, what are these cases settling for? How much money are they settling for? If they're settling for a small amount of money, like a million dollars or less, uh, you might think these are nuisance settlements, they're just trying to avoid litigation expenses. But, you know, it's again, a very small minority class action cases are being settled for a million dollars or less. Another thing I look at in the chapter is um, what do Republican district judges do compared to Democrat district judges with class action cases? So let's say the company wants to settle the case and, and it believes it's a meritless case and again it's just settling for the nuisance value. Are Republican district judges awarding class action lawyers smaller fees? than Democrat judges, because you'd think if the case was meritless and the company was just settling it to avoid the nuisance value, Republican judges would be less inclined to reward class action lawyers for that. But I don't find that at all. No statistically significant difference between the fees of Republican district court judges and Democrat district court judges. And so it's just, it's just hard to come up with any data to suggest that there's a lot of meritless cases. And the last thing I look at in the chapter, this is less data driven. Um, but I look at the, the lists of the most frivolous cases filed every year that the U.S. Chamber puts out. They put out the, the worst cases of the year list every year. And a lot of those cases are not class action cases, but some of them are class action cases. And I think over the last four or five years, they had 10 class action cases on this list, on these lists that they put out, these annual lists. And I looked at the cases to see how bad are these cases. And, you know, Subway was on there. And there were some cases against Starbucks for not filling up your, your latte all the way to the top of the cup or something like this. <laughs> so, 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 you know, some of the 10, about half of the 10, I agree, were totally frivolous. But the other half of the 10 actually were not that frivolous. So there was a case against Jimmy John's where they said, these are the ingredients that's on you. They're going to be on your sandwiches, and they didn't put some of the ingredients on the sandwich. <laughs> See, what, what sorts of ingredients were they, at least allegedly, not putting on the sandwich that they said were? If I remember correctly, they were not putting on the alfalfa sprouts. They were leaving off the alfalfa sprouts, and I just thought, you know, if you're going to advertise al al alfalfa sprouts, then you better yeah. put alfalfa sprouts on. I don't think that. I don't think it's that crazy. There was another case. Um, that I didn't think was that crazy uh, against uh, Starbucks for the time the employees had to spend closing the store every night. They were not being compensated for the extra, I don't know, five minutes or whatever a night they had to spend closing up the store. And, you know, that adds up over the course of a, of a week or a year. I think I calculated that the number of minutes that they were spent, were not being compensated for closing up the store amounted to about a half a work week of of salary that's you know that's decent money for for people i didn't think that was that crazy to say they should get compensated for all the time they're spending at work um and uh, so you know i looked at it and i thought if these are the worst class actions if these are the worst cases you can find every year and some of them are at least debatable 
that suggested to me there's not that many subway cases really out there. And so I kind of concluded that we don't have a huge problem with meritless cases. Um, and there's some tweaks I think we can make to the system to make it even harder to bring a meritless class action. And I advocate for, for these tweaks in the book. But I think this is largely um, a myth and not a reality. One of the things I wonder about here is, is part of the disconnect in this conversation uh, for those of us who are generally in favor of class actions, obviously not all of them, but um, as a as a tool, a vehicle for uh, redressing harm and those who think that it should be done away with. Perhaps we're talking past each other because we use the term meritless in different ways. It, take the Jimmy Johns and the alfalfa sprouts or whatever the ingredients were. I wonder if the Chamber of Commerce is saying not so much that it's meritless in the way you and I would use the term, but that it's one of those things that they just say, no, get over it. Uh, come on. It's an alfalfa sprout. It's like, what, two cents worth of stuff. And if you get a sandwich that doesn't have alfalfa sprouts, tell them to put some alfalfa sprouts on it. We don't have to make a federal case out of everything. Is there is there something to that that we're just talking past each other on what we mean by meritless? Well, now that's a very good question, and it, it's actually a very hard thing to um, define, uh, and you kind of have to use proxies for it because no one really wants to look at the merits of each case and make some kind of judgment, which is why I kind of rely on do Republican judges and Democrat judges do things differently or motions dismissed. So I think you're absolutely right. It's hard to define, and I do confront in the book this argument that says basically don't sweat the small stuff mm -hmm. that these little um breaches if you will are the normal course of living in a society there are going to be some people that just don't treat you right a little bit every single day and you need to learn to live with it because otherwise um you're going to drive yourself crazy and so I think there is something to this notion that sometimes these minor inconveniences of life are too small to um, worry about. And in fact, there was a, I read a decision from the 11th Circuit just a couple of days ago that involved the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, um, which, you know, gives you $500 if you get robo called or robo texted mm -hmm. without your consent. And the 11th Circuit said, if you've only been robo-texted once, you don't have standing to sue in federal court because it's such a small injury. And I think they're probably wrong about that. I think even small injuries count as injuries. But I get the broader point, yeah. which is maybe we shouldn't be running to federal court uh, for every little thing that, that happens. And, um, you know... I understand that, um, but here's the thing. If companies know they can steal $5 from us whenever they want to because it's too small mm -hmm. to go to federal court about, then they're going to have the incentive to steal $5 from us over and over again. So it's going to really give them a green light to take small amounts of, of money from us. and. At some point, you know, when you add up all the five five dollars that people are taking from you, it begins to become a recent amount of money and a decent amount of money. And so I, I just, I'm not, I don't feel like it's the conservative thing to do to say, let's give a green light for people to steal small amounts of money from us. Um, I think that if people are making promises, they should keep the promises. And letting them off the hook because it's a small amount of money will just encourage them uh, from encourage them to take more money from us in the future. And so I, I, I'm not persuaded that the smallness is reason enough just to let these folks off the hook. I'm I'm going to go back to I, I keep harping on definitions here, and I didn't really come into this conversation thinking, oh, I'm going to just think about how every word is defined. But when I try a, a personal injury case, I'm often, not explicitly, 
But I'm fighting with the defense lawyer over what the definitions are as far as what happened. And here, I think, so take the five minutes from the Starbucks employees. It, it's five minutes. If you define it as five minutes that Starbucks is taking away from their employees, that's, yeah, you probably ought to just get over five minutes and move on with your life. But that's not what Starbucks was doing, assuming that that allegation's right. I don't know anything about it. I'll, I'll, I'm going to take it as true for now. They're not stealing five minutes. They're stealing hundreds upon hundreds and maybe thousands upon thousands of hours. And they're just dividing it up into smaller bits to make it look like it's small and to make it look like it's not very noticeable. I mean, it, you can have a, um, I'm metaphoring on the fly, which is a probably a bad idea. But when you have a, a, a huge rainstorm, you don't have billions upon billions of tiny little drops. We don't think of it that way. We think of it as one big event because it's experienced as one big event. And um, we don't, it, it really is broken down into billions and billions of little drops that are each drop in and of itself is utterly inconsequential. And to Starbucks, the five minutes a day that it takes from each employee is utterly inconsequential. But however many hundreds of thousands of employees that they have taking five minutes a day from each one of them, and you're st you start talking about real money even to a company the size of Starbucks. So I think maybe the definition of, maybe we need to stop conceding the ground to the, the Chamber of Commerce that these are small harms. These are huge harms just spread out over hundreds of thousands or, or sometimes more people. Well, I like the way you put that. I, I, I agree with that. Um, they're only small when you slice it that way. They're not small when you look at it in the aggregate, even for a single employee, you know, losing five minutes a day every day for five days a week, 50 weeks a year. I calculate in the book is almost 2000, almost a thousand minutes a year. That's half a work mm -hmm. week. And I think that's real money. Half a work week is real money for, for I someone. guarantee you it was, it's real money for, uh, those of us lawyers who are billing by the hour. I don't know what you were billing <laughs> per hour at Sidley Austin, but, <laughs> and you were breaking it down because that's lawyers break it down into six minute increments. And if somebody, you know, I, I don't do very much work by the hour, but when I do, it's in six minute increments and every, every six minute matters to me. I mean, it's, that's Not a good in, point. If I get, you know, if I lose six minutes uh, a year, no, well, that's not gonna, that's not gonna break me. But those six minutes, um, yeah, I suppose if you're a barista making twelve bucks an hour, I don't know what, I don't know what a Starbucks barista makes. It looks pretty inconsequential to the Chamber of Comber Commerce, and I'm going to call them fat cats just to just to cast aspersions for the fun of it. Um, that's nothing to them, but if you took five minutes of their time at the rates that they're getting paid, they might they might perk up a little more. Well, I think that's a good point. I think that's a good point. None of us wants to be denied 1,000 of our minutes, um, compensation for 1,000 of our minutes. Um, if you are making minimum wage, you need every dollar you can get. And if you're making a lot more minimum wa than minimum wage, those dollars are very, very valuable. And so I, I think that, again, when we look at the, these lawsuits closely, they, they don't strike me as ridiculous. Even if we can debate here whether the five minutes a day is worth suing about, it's at least debatable. And if this is the worst of the worst, according to the Chamber of Commerce, it's not that bad. Right. There's another class action that you discuss in the book um, involving Bank of America. And I think there was a similar one, um, maybe with Wells Fargo, about how they were yes. ordering transactions. So I have I have two questions. Well, really, it's first of all, just briefly explain what happened there, because that's one of those that I, I had heard about that before. But what they were doing, it just makes me angry because it's it's abusive and it's abusive to people who can least afford it and least afford to get abused and who are least likely to notice and be able to do something about it. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, after you tell us what that case was about, 
what would the Chamber of Commerce say should be done about a case like that? Well, uh, this is a you know a great case, and you're right. It uh, there was a case against both Bank of America and Wells Fargo, and frankly, about two dozen other banks. Because <laughs> what happened was this: these banks hire consultants to help them increase their profits, and I guess they all hired the same consultant <laughs> because <laughs> they all ended up doing the same. Thing. And this is what they did. They decided they could make more money on overdraft fees if they reordered the way in which they processed our debit card transactions. So instead of processing our transactions chronologically as we make them throughout the day, throughout the week, what they decided they would do is they would hold our transactions in abeyance for two or three days. And then they would process them all at once, but they would reorder them when they did that. Instead of chronological order, they would process them from the biggest transaction to the smallest transaction. And the reason they did that was because if you take the biggest transactions out first, if someone is going to hit zero and then go into overdraft, they hit zero more quickly. Mm -hmm. And then every other transaction after that point, you charge a separate overdraft fee on. So you can imagine a situation where there's 10 transactions and the person would have gone into overdraft only at the very end on the last transaction. Mm -hmm. And if you use chronological order, then that person would pay one fee. But if you took out the biggest ones first and, and, and the smallest ones later, maybe they would go into overdraft after the second transaction. And there'd be eight transactions after that you could charge a fee on. So they made uh, Bank of America, if I remember the number correctly, made several billion dollars just on this change over the course of a few years. Well, it's probably because so people they, like Michael Dell and Warren Buffett and Bill Gates overdraft often, and they're they're just taking it from from billionaires, not poor people. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. No, it's definitely the people who could least afford it that are are, are the ones that are being victimized by this change. And um, so they made this change, and they made a bunch of money from it, and. The class action lawyers sued Bank of America. They sued Wells Fargo. They sued a couple dozen other banks for all kinds of causes of action. There was some consumer fraud. There was some breach of the duty of good faith in the in, in interpreting the contracts, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of these banks had language in their contracts that said, we reserve the right to reorder how we process your transactions in, in any order we like. And so that was a formidable de defense these banks had. And the argument was that you breached the duty of good faith when you decided to exercise your discretion in a way that only made more profits for you and that hurt people in unexpected ways. Um, so they weren't, you know, frankly, slam dunks legally mm -hmm. as kind of, I think, pernicious as the practice is. But um, so they ended up getting sued in the class actions. Now, now, here's the interesting thing. About half of the banks that were sued um, did not have these class action waivers in their arbitration agreements that I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, that the court in AT&T v. Concepcion had said is just fine. And half of the banks did have these class action waivers in arbitration. And what happened was the banks that didn't have any class action waivers ended up getting sued and ended up having to settle for billions of dollars. The banks that did have the class action waivers all got off scot-free, didn't pay a dime. That's amazing. Because uh, who's going to sue for $100, right. you know, three overdraft fees? No one. And so it's a stark example of what these class action waivers mean. In one case, 
here they mean you can take billions of dollars by reordering people's transactions and not pay a dime. And uh, so what would the chamber say about these banks? Well, I think, um, uh, you know, according to what they've been saying lately, they would say the proper thing to do here is have the government tell us when we can and cannot reorder transactions. We don't need the private bar and the courts making these rules. We'd rather have a uniform rule from Washington, D.C. that tells us when we can and cannot reorder the transactions. irony of that is that's what they would is say shocking. i know well from a from a conservative point of view i mean don't we believe in state rights don't we believe in federalism the the chamber has totally abandoned mm-hmm. federalism they 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 are happy to preempt state law whenever they can get a weak uniform rule from washington and and so i you know one of the the, the themes that i try to strike at the very beginning of the book is is the following Just because the U.S. Chamber of Commerce says something doesn't mean it's conservative. I like the chamber. I like big businesses. I represented them when I was a lawyer at Sidley. I thank them every single day for the prosperity they have brought our country. But, and and, and nine times out of ten, what the U.S. Chamber wants is consistent with conservative principles. But one time out of ten, it's not. And and this is one of those times. It strikes me that a lot of what has happened in the conservative movement, I don't like the word movement, but I don't have a better one right now, is that what used to be and what Milton Friedman and Hayek would probably have called a pro-market and pro-free market uh, philosophy has morphed into a pro-business philosophy. And what the chamber advocates is not free markets so much as they mark as they advocate what is pro business and since they're business that's in their self interest but it's not a philosophically coherent thing to say i'm for small government and so i want them to regulate how i order my transact my customers transactions the 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 philosophy um and the principles have gone out the window in favor of self interest on that which i mean look we're all we're all subject to our own self interest and everything but I'd like to see them uh, adhere more to the principles that they claim to espouse. I, I could not agree with you more on this. And I and I don't blame the chamber. They are doing what is in their self-interest, and that's what people do. I blame the rest of us for not appreciating that and letting them get away with it, even when it's not consistent with our principles. And you put the principles exactly right. We believe in com- competition, competitive markets, incumbent businesses that are successful, like big corporations. They don't like competition. They're already winning. They don't want someone to come and replace them. So they're never going to be for competition. They are winners in the current system and they'd like to keep their market share and shut down compensation. Comp- uh, competition now that they're the winners. And I, I start the book with a wonderful quotation from Milton Friedman on this very point, and I'm just going to read it very briefly. He says, over and over again, you have the big businessman who talks very effectively about the great virtues of free enterprise, and at the same time, he is off on a plane to Washington to push for special legislation or some special measures for his own benefit. I don't blame him from the point of view of his business. But I do blame the rest of us for not recognizing that the free enterprise system is not going to be saved by General Electric or General Motors. And mm-hmm. I, I, I just, I think that's exactly right. Free, being pro-free enterprise is not the same thing as being pro-big business. Right. What did Justice Scalia, how did he approach the idea of class actions. And we know that um, I think you said he wrote or at least joined the opinion um, on the arbitration clause issue, which has a huge impact. And you go into that. And I think it's one of the one of the more important issues and in the public uh, public discussion among people who aren't lawyers it's one of the underappreciated issues. But on class actions themselves, what did Justice Scalia, how did he think about these whether it's expressed in 
his writings or or conversations that weren't private and that you would want to protect? Well, I will tell you the honest truth is whether he fully appreciated it or not, Justice Scalia is more responsible than any other justice on the U.S. Supreme Court for putting class actions behind the eight ball. He wrote that decision in AT&T v. Concepcion, which said class action waivers are legal, preempting state unconscionability laws otherwise. He doubled down on that holding a few years later in a case called American Express v. Three Colors Italian Restaurant. And these cases, which basically give the green light to companies to put class action waivers everywhere, uh, those decisions have been the leading reason why class actions are in decline. So I don't know if he fully appreciated the implications of, of, of these decisions, but he is responsible uh, for the current state of, of class actions, which I think is is weak and in decline in this in this country. And I will tell you that he he wrote these decisions after I left my clerkship, so I I could not um, you know obviously give him my two cents about them before they were written. But I did have a chance <laughs> to give my two cents to him about them after they were written, after the second one came down in the Italian Colors case. Um, I uh, saw him at our annual law clerk reunion in Washington, D.C. We would always gather in, in, the, uh, in May, the first Saturday of May all the law clerks for a reunion with the justice in the Supreme Court building. It was a very nice dinner and speeches, and it was always lovely. But I saw him at the reception before the dinner, and I walked in, and it's, it's black ties, we're all in our tuxedos, and I walk in and I just make a, a, a beeline for him. Before I even got my cocktail, I cornered him and I said, Justice, I am very upset with you. And he and he had a, he had a look of 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 concern on his face. And he, he said, "Brian, why?" And I said, "These decisions of yours that are ending class action litigation." I said, "If you're going to end the class action, you could at least cite some of my law review articles somewhere in your opinions, and you're not even doing that for me." And uh, he he laughed. He laughed and uh, he, see, uh, he said, I'll see what we can do in the future opinions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see what we can do, meaning but, um, um, I'll but anyway. see, but I may not probably do anything. That's right. That's right. No, but so he and I saw things very differently in this regard, and I don't know why. Um, I did have a conversation with him uh, uh, just maybe a year before he passed away about – these arbitration decisions in his in his office. So it was a more candid conversation. And I I said, Justice, what is going on with this Federal Arbitration Act stuff? And he said, Brian, um, you know, I don't know if we're right or wrong about the original understanding of the Federal Arbitration Act, but I do know that before I got here, we had a bunch of precedents that interpreted the Federal Arbitration Act a certain way. And we're following those precedents. So maybe we got off on the wrong foot, but now that we're on that foot, we're going to keep walking. And uh, so, you know, we we did have a chance to engage on it, but I, I, I think that he just saw things differently from a matter of statutory interpretation. On the policies, um, you know, I didn't have a lot of time to – share with him over the policies of class action. And so I don't know how he felt. There were some indications in some of his opinions that he, he, his intuitions were with the, the chamber, that a lot of these cases were abusive and filed to enrich lawyers rather than to deter misconduct or to compensate people. Um, but I didn't have as much chance to talk to him about the policies as I did the Federal Arbitration Act, and, and, and his view seemed to be it was following precedent 
right or wrong. And on on the issue, I just want listeners to know we haven't had chance a chance to cover everything in this conversation you cover in the book. Of course, we wouldn't want to do that because then nobody need to go buy the book. But you do take on this issue of are class actions just enriching lawyers? And in a word, no. I mean, yeah, class action lawyers are making money on it, but it's not. They just are filing a lawsuit and they're getting paid off and nobody else is getting anything. And I would encourage listeners to go because I think that's on the on the plaintiff side of the bar, whether it's personal injury or class actions or whatever, um, the tort reformers and the Chamber of Commerce. But I repeat myself, um, they kind of everything is in their view. It's just lawyers getting rich um, and not actual humans, non-lawyer humans who are clients who have been injured actually getting money. And and you debunk that notion um, pretty powerfully. But in the in the last couple of minutes we have, you suggest a few tweaks to the class, class action that would make it better, that would address some of the Chamber of Commerce's more valid concerns. Um, can you give us a couple of examples of things that you think could be done that would make things better? Yes. And, and I do try very hard to meet the chamber halfway in this book. I think a lot of their criticisms are not sound, but I do think they have some fair critiques. And I think we do need to tweak the system a bit to respond to these critiques. And so I think the number one reform that may even be able to get bipartisan support is to remove from class actions, various causes of action that obviously will result in over-deterrence if a class action is allowed to be used with the cause of action. And so here I mean these statutory damages claims, like the Telephone Consumer Protection Act that we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. You get $500 every time a company robo calls you or robo texts you, you're not harmed $500 every time that happens. The reason why Congress put that number in there is because they didn't think everyone was going to sue and they wanted to induce some people to sue. Well, if we have a class action, everyone is suing and that's massive over deterrence. Some of these companies face trillion dollar liability from robo calls. It's absurd. And over, uh, When you threaten companies with such damages, they're obviously going to settle for more than they probably should, and you get over deterrence. And I think that is a serious concern. You can also get over deterrence because of the way class action trials unfold. If you have one jury deciding everyone's claim, the company cannot risk going to trial because you could get a crazy jury, an out an outlier jury that would sock you with billions of dollars of damages, even though the average jury would only sock you with, say, a million dollars of damages. Mm -hmm. So because we put all of our eggs in one basket, it's very risky for companies to go to trial. The plaintiff's bar knows that. If you get past summary judgment, you've got real leverage uh, over a company to extract more money than you should be able to extract because of the risk. And so one of the things I propose in the book is we should use sampling in class action trials. We should randomly pick some class members and try the claims individually and then average the results over the class. That would reduce the riskiness of going to trial. Um, On the meritless cases, again, I'm not too concerned about them, but I do worry uh, about companies oversettling cases because of litigation expenses. Uh, but either way, whether you think there's meritless cases or you think the companies are oversettling to avoid litigation expenses, one thing I think it's well past time that we do in this country is we do something about discovery expenses. Something has to be done to spread the pain of discovery. Defendants, in my opinion, suffer too much by having to cull through all their e-discovery. It's very expensive. Plaintiffs know this. And defendants have an incentive to settle cases to avoid these discovery expenses. I 
I think there should be more sharing of discovery expenses. One of the things I propose in the book is what about a, let's start with a 95-5 share. That if you ask for something, uh, the responder pays 95%, but the requester has to pay 5% automatically. Let's just see how that works for a while to see uh, if it might lead to more responsible discovery requests and make people a little less willing to bring cases that have borderline merit. Another thing that I um, advocate in the book is uh, some changes in how we compensate the lawyers. I think for the most part, we're doing a good job with our formulas for compensation. Uh, but I actually think that there's some way courts probably pay lawyers too little. Uh, and there's some way the courts probably pay lawyers too much. And so I, I have some reforms there as well. But the, the big point of the last chapter is this, is that none of these reforms are going to matter if these class action waivers in arbitration continue to yep. proliferate. And I think it's imperative for people who want to save the class action to offer the business community some legitimate reforms in the hope that they might go along with an amendment to the Federal Arbitration Act, which would say class action waivers are not enforceable if they're unconscionable under state law. And so that's really the spirit of the last chapter. It's to try to come up with a grand bargain between the left and the right that would keep the class action around, um, but you know, respond, I think, appropriately to legitimate concerns that businesses have. So, Professor, how can uh, people find out more about your work on this issue and others, and where can they find a copy of the conservative case for class actions? Well, I have a website, www.brian.com fitzpatrick.com all one word you can read more about the book there it, it has i have my blurbs up I, I have a blurb uh from from uh, senator john cornyn i've got a blurb from uh, leonard leo a blurb from ken Starr. uh you can read those and and more about the book there you can order the book from a link on that website or you can go to amazon and order it and it'll be out in about uh two Fantastic. And by the time this posts, I don't, I don't know exactly when that's going to be, but the release date is actually, is it October 23rd? 22nd. 22nd. Okay. So by the time this actually is available for folks to listen to, it's not going to be two weeks anymore. It might already be ready. And I would encourage everyone to go get it. And I, I have had the opportunity to read it. And if you're, for those listeners who aren't lawyers, if you're thinking it's going to be a, a legal brief, it's not. It's a very, almost conversational uh, read that's uh, it digs into substantive issues, but it does so in a way that um, it's, it's just, it's very readable. And uh, so I would commend you for making um, a discussion about class actions readable to someone who is not necessarily just uh, going to be a complete nerd on something like this. But if you, there's also extensive notes. And if you want to dig a whole lot deeper into the issues than what is in the body of the book, uh, you can do that in the notes. So um, I highly recommend it to all of our listeners to go get a copy and read it and uh, then talk to people who make decisions about our laws about implementing some of these things. Uh, Professor Fitz, Fitz <laughs> how, how about stumbling over your name at the very end? Professor Fitzpatrick, thank you very much for being my guest on the Personal Responsibility Lawyer. It was my pleasure. I had a wonderful time. And thank you so much for inviting me. Um, thank you, sir. And uh, to all of our listeners, we will see you next time. This episode of the Personal Responsibility Lawyer podcast is brought to you by my law firm, Levens Trostclair, where we use the civil justice system to hold people responsible for irresponsible choices when those irresponsible choices cause serious injuries and sometimes even death. We are personal injury trial lawyers, but we approach our cases a little differently than a lot of other lawyers who do the same basic kind of work. I really, really hope that you do not need us, but if you do need us, please call us before evidence gets lost. You can call us at 512-535-1649. Tell us you heard about us on the Personal Responsibility Lawyer podcast. You can also go to our 
website on the interwebs at www.ltlegalteam.com. That's L as in Lovins, T as in Trosclair, legalteam.com. We are here to help. Thank you for listening to the Personal Responsibility Lawyer Podcast. If you like what you've heard or if you've learned something interesting, please do me a favor and rate the show on iTunes. It really does help. You can get more information about this show, including the show notes, at my personal website, michaellovins.com. And now I have to do some disclaimers where I say stuff that you already knew, but i got to say it anyway so that I keep the state bar happy. This podcast is not legal advice. You listening to this podcast does not make me your lawyer or you my client. Neither does it make any of my guests your lawyer. If you want me to be your lawyer, contact my office. If I can represent you, we will execute a written contract stating the specific terms under which I agree to represent you. Did you really need me to tell you that? I really, really hope not. Also, I am not certified by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization as a personal responsibility lawyer because they don't know what that is. They also have not certified me in any other areas of specialty that they actually do recognize. I think that does it for disclaimers. For Lovins Trosclair and the Personal Responsibility Lawyer Podcast, I am Michael Lovins. We'll see you next time.